Hello, this is the Ancient History, Ancient and Medieval History Lecture for Friday, October 16th, 2020. For those of you at home, which is all of you, uh, where we have taken things from is through the various stages of astrophysical history from the time of the, uh, well, what was right before the Big Bang, up through the change in climates caused by very likely a change in uh, ocean currents that disrupted the warm water conveyor that ran around the equator when the Tethys Seaway was closed by the kissing of Africa and Eurasia and the creation of the modern Middle East, and by North and South America coming together to form the Isthmus of Panama. Both of these disruptions caused climate instability on a fundamental level, and we are right now in an interglacial, inter-ice age period. Unless something radically changes, the likelihood is that uh, we will at some point have another time when there's a mile of ice right here in North Idaho between the ground and the surface. But this rise in instability and the intensification of winter brings about a set of natural circumstances that favor mammals, warm-blooded mammals, mammals that give live birth, mammals whose females lactate and provide milk. Mammals are designed to handle the winter well. We have fur. We have body fat that's designed to nutrify us, but also to shield us from the cold. So as the climate instability grows, the mammalian domination of the planet, which had been proceeding throughout the Cenozoic, uh, but in early, early on in competition with the birds, uh, turns much more in favor of the mammals. Now, we are a product of the Ice Ages. In effect, mouse-like creatures uh, separate out uh, proto-monkey and apes. Then you have the proto-monkeys and apes, and the apes separate from the monkeys, and then the primates separate from the other apes, and we separate from the strain that produces the chimpanzee, which has a lot of the same DNA that we do. The human species is only around 3 million years old. Life was 3.8 billion years old. So 3,800 million years ago or so, the first life appears. 3 million years ago, the first distinctly proto-human ape-like creatures exist in Africa, according to Darwin's theory of evolution and what we develop later. But here's how we are creatures of the Ice Age. Early on, our ancestors are arboreal primates. In other words, we live in them trees. And living in the trees, we are uh, we develop certain traits that make us human. We have binocular vision. We have an opposable thumb. And these qualities are really important. First of all, since I don't have binocular vision because I'm blind in one eye, I can tell you binocular vision is kind of important in order to spot accurately objects in three-dimensional space. So, uh, why do we have binocular vision? Because if we don't, uh, as we jump from tree branch to tree branch, we will fall and all the females will laugh at us and we won't get to breed and we become evolutionary dead ends. As such, uh, binocular vision is rather key. Also, the opposable thumb. Our ability to grip comes from this arboreal phase this phase where we are in trees. So two of the five great characteristics that make us who we are uh, develop out of this arboreal period. Now, an advantage 
of having binocular vision is that we have depth perception. In other words, just as I said, we can spot branches in three-dimensional space, and we can jump to those branches and back and forth and so forth. Uh, so in reality, uh, we can see things. But we what we really have as an advantage of binocular vision is we have predator vision. Our attention is focused ahead of us because our eyes are focused on the front of our skull. Prey have eyes on the side of their head so that they get the maximum possible view with the fewest possible or the smallest possible blind spot. Some of them have eyes so much on the sides of their skulls that they almost could be said to have eyes in the back of their head. But that binocular vision that not only gives us the ability to spot 3D objects, also gives us a psychological focus. Remember, we are sight-oriented creatures. The dominant uh, sense of a human being is not smell. That's a dog's. It's not hearing. That's a bat's or a cat's. It's seeing. And by having both of our eyes focused in front of us, we are able to psychologically focus on what we have in our hands and on what is directly in front of us. And that focus is going to allow us the psychological scope to develop tool-making abilities, which is going to come later. We'll tinker with things. We'll fidget with things. We'll tweak things and mess with things until they suit us. And that comes from the binocular vision's psychological focus on what is right here in front of us and our hands with our clever thumbs. Now, a disadvantage of binocular vision is obviously we have poor peripheral vision. You know, I could be standing here, and if I didn't have a camera behind me, or even with a camera, a vampire could be sneaking up on me. Boom, boom. And I wouldn't know it because cameras don't pick up vampires. Boom, boom, boom. And I don't see it, and all of a sudden, I start getting siphoned by the vampire, and uh-oh, I'm being attacked by a vampire, and I wouldn't know it because I don't see it, and I don't hear it or anything else either because it's sneaky. Now, opposable thumbs. If you doubt the advantage of having opposable thumbs, I used to assign this as homework. Tape your thumbs to your hands for three hours in the evening and see what it's like. See what it's like to try to eat your dinner without thumbs. What it's like to operate the, tele the, the, the television uh, or the computer without thumbs. Thumbs are kind of important. How to inter even how to interact with people, how to do things, normal things around the house, like do the dishes. Without thumbs, we are like the whales or the dolphins or the elephants who have brains as big or bigger than ours. Whales could be super geniuses, but if they are, they're theoretical poet poetical geniuses because they don't have the ability to shape the world. They've got flukes, not hands with thumbs. These tool-using podal hand things, these monos hands, manual, they give us the ability to reshape the physical environment to suit us. And thus, our intellect has an outlet in the practical world that allows us to start using and building tools that are going to change everything. If whales had opposable thumbs, maybe they would be the dominant creatures on Earth, not us. But they don't. And elephants have that lovely trunk, but they don't have opposable thumbs either, and they've only got one trunk. Now, what's the disadvantage of opposable thumbs? I don't know, getting it caught in things? Hitchhikers? I really can't think of one. Unless you want to consider this. The tools we make could very well destroy our world someday. And oh, what, a, what, a, what a happy thought that is. Uh, we'll come back to that. So from our arbor arboreal forebears, we get the binocular vision and the opposable thumbs. This is flipping back from the various uh, things that are important for human beings to be human and the um, development of human beings as seen on this page. 
Okay. So where are boreal primitives? And then an ice age comes. And our ancestors are in Central Eastern Africa. They are the Australopithecus. But what happens when the forests wither and die? Which they do, thanks to the drying of the climate of the Ice Age. The forests literally wither and die. They retract into smaller highland forests. And suddenly, our ancestors are in the Great Plains. They are not in the forests anymore. And as they are in the Great Plains, they have to adapt or perish. Go ahead and drop it off. So, how do you adapt or perish to being in the Great Plains? You're no longer in a tree. Well, first of all, uh, our early ancestors were brachiators. In other words, they were knuckle walkers. They would walk on all four limbs, and the hands, would uh, we'd walk on our knuckles, like a gorilla does today, or a chimpanzee. We had longer arms relative to our body size, and uh, as brachiating creatures, we'd walk around on all fours. And then some meerkat-thinking fellow decides, hey, why not look around by standing on our hind feet? And eventually, people start doing that more and more. They start standing on their hind feet and looking around. This is an adaptation from the Ice Age and from the Plains, and it changes everything. Because by standing on our hind feet, we give ourselves several advantages. First of all, our sensory organs, our eyes, our ears, our nose, and our communication organ, our mouth, are all as high off the ground as possible, as isolated from the low and medium grade predators as possible. Plus, we can see farther. Threats and opportunities. And that's what we do as, as, as early humans. We wander around the wilderness looking for opportunities and looking to deal with or avoid threats. That's our thing. We walk, we look, we react. We plan, we walk, we look, we react. And by having our sense organs higher off the ground, we can um, spot threats and opportunities better. But again, we now have these clever forepaws. And all we have to do with them is use and make tools and carry them. We can become tool-using creatures 24-7, 365. We can carry bags and spears and clubs and anything else we want in these clever forepaws. We can protect ourselves. We can take advantage of the opportunities, and we can fight off the threats more fully than we could before. Of course, on the downside of having uh, an upright stance, which is what this is, an upright stance, the downside of the upright stance is that we're standing here with our viscera all exposed, our vital organs. See, most animals will protect their vital organs behind their haunches, their hips, their thighs. And they'll have a tail that might be able to protect them, too. We walk around in so many words saying, Hey, universe, cut out my guts. Take your best shot. We've got our privates and our vitals and our soft, tasty innards right there, ready to be ripped open and bit apart. So that's a disadvantage. Here's another one. All human martial arts, all human unarmed fighting, and some armed combat techniques also, are built around the fact that we walk around on our hind feet like idiots. And therefore, what we're trying to do is keep our balance while knocking our opponent off balance. If you can knock your enemy down, you have an advantage. You can then start pounding on him. You have the mobility. He's on his back. Pa-pam, pow, boom. Maybe you win. 
Don't try this with a kitten. You get a kitten upside down, he'll la machine your hand with his claws and his teeth. But in general terms, you win a fight as a human being by knocking your opponent down. That's part of it. Why? Because we're so darn easy to knock down. Uh, really, we're clumsy. You think birds are just tweeting in the morning? No, they're laughing at us because, oh, here comes the human walking around on two hind legs. And we're clumsy. We're also slow. A good quadruped of any kind almost that's equivalent in size or even close to us can outrun us because they have four legs, all pushing down on the environment and shoving them forward into space. We run around like idiots Ooh, ah, 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 on our hind feet. We're clumsy. So being clumsy and walking around with our vital organs ready to be ripped open, those are downsides, downsides of, the, of the upright stance. But they're not, uh, they don't outweigh the advantages we have to spot opportunities and threats farther away and to carry and use tools all the time that we might want. So this time that we walk around is the time of the last of the man-like apes. And that is Australopithecus afarensis. Australopithecus afarensis is still an ape. Australopithecus, the genus name, means great southern ape. So. The great southern ape from afar, I guess. I don't know what afarensis means. I'm guessing. He's about this tall, the size of a child or a hobbit. About as tall as my hips. And he's got a stance that is still brachiating. He's still using his knuckles to walk as much as his back feet. He's got a fairly small cranium. He's got these thick eyebrow ridges, which is typical of most apes. And these thick eyebrow ridges go almost straight back. There is very little or almost no forehead or forebrain. The slope of the skull is extremely back. He's also got a snout, which combines the nose and the mouth. Very simian type skull and facial features. Now, as we get more comfortable in the plains, according to the theory of evolution, the first of the ape-like men appears. Not Australopithecus genus, genus Homo, which is human being. Homo habilis. Literally, it means handyman. Like Tim the Toolman Taylor from the old TV show Home Improvement. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Homo habilis means handyman. Australopithecus, like many apes today, will use tools like chimpanzees will approach a termite mound in Africa and lick a thin stick and then stick it in and it comes out, mmm, termites, mmm, yum, 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 yum. Homo habilis will do more than just pick up a stick and use it or pick up a rock and use it. Homo habilis famously makes chipped stone tools. You find something like flint, which cleaves really well and creates a good sharp edge. And you develop the patience and the skill to tamp away at it. Tip, 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 flick. Tip, 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 flick. And you want to do this without shattering the rock in your hand. It takes hours. It takes your muscles cramp. It's just awful. But they learn how to do it. And the result is that Homo habilis can make a stone knife that can slice and a, sto a stone knife that can stab. And Homo habilis can also use that knife to sharpen a stick and make a, a thrusting spear. Boom! All useful things. Homo habilis, handyman, tool using ape, comes about around two and a half million years ago to just over one and a half million years ago. The great southern ape from afar from almost 4 million years ago to about 3 million years ago. So we're a little older than 3 million years, but only a little. Um, now, handyman. 
eventually morphs into, evolutionarily, if you believe in that sort of thing, the most successful human species ever in terms of longevity as a dominant species. Homo erectus. <laughs> yeah, that's the name, Homo erectus. Get your inner seventh grader under control. It means upright man. Uh, homo means man. Erectus means upright. Now, Homo erectus first appears in fossil records almost 2 million years ago, about 1,800,000 years ago. And they're around until just under 100,000 years ago. 100,000 years. That's not much in evolutionary time. They were around. They've been around longer than us. We've only been around for, oh, God, what? Uh, 70, 80, 100,000 years. And that's in variant forms. They were around for much longer. And Homo erectus is the first human to have as the normal stance, the upright stance. That's why they're called upright man. Now you will see the difference between Australopithecus afarensis and Homo erectus is pretty clear. Homo habilis is an intermediary stage. He's still got the snout, he's still got the brow ridge, but there's the beginning of a forebrain. Just the beginning of an area of forehead directly above the eyes. Homo erectus has a much larger cranium and uh, is able to fit a much larger brain by cubic centimeters. He also has separated out his nose and his mouth from a snout arrangement until nose-mouth arrangement. And again, he, uh, he walks upright. Homo erectus is also the first human being to develop a weapon or use a weapon of mass destruction to his advantage. Because Homo erectus learns how to master fire. And in mastering fire, Homo erectus is the first human ancestor to leave Africa. Up until now, we've been an African creature, like lions and African elephants. But now, thanks to Homo erectus, we're not. Homo erectus crosses the new land bridge that used to be the Tethys Seaway across to Eurasia. They go westward into Europe. They go eastward into Asia. Uh, they even go southeastward into as far as the island of Java uh, in Indonesia, which used to be connected to Asia by a land bridge. They went to China and northern China. They populated the entire Eurasian landmass as well as Africa. Now, the upright stance, as I told you, has the advantage of giving you the uh, longer range detection gear and making you a tool user. But fire is a huge deal. What does fire give us? Well, fire cooks our food. Without fire, we're stuck eating rotting dead flesh raw. That may sound fine for sushi, but remember, it takes years to be a sushi chef to become a sushi chef, before that, you'll just be a poisoner because you'll be feeding people raw stuff that will give them worms or just kill them. So fire cooks our food, allowing us to preserve it for longer and allowing us to uh, eat more of it um, without it causing us harm. Fire also allows us to survive in winter climates because it provides heat. When it's cold, we gather around the fire. Fire also gives us a weapon against the dark. Remember, we're sight-oriented creatures. And suddenly, we have the ability to have a campfire and to have a torch. We can bring light to the darkness. That is a huge psychological advantage. For the first time, the night need not be dark and full of terrors without any kind of remission. Every creature on earth is afraid of fire. You get a toddler who doesn't know any better. <gasps> Mom, what's that on the stove? It's purple and orange and it's yellow and it's beautiful. Well, at this point, you'll see there are two kinds of parents. One kind of parent will say, stop! Don't go anywhere near that. 
That's fire. It hurts. Don't touch the fire. And another kind of parent will go, hmm, let's see what happens. <gasps> it's so cute. I, ah! Because it's fire. It hurts. Now, a kid's probably not going to get so close to the fire that they'll really hurt, hurt themselves. I'm not a parent. And probably it shows during this because most parents wouldn't let the kid actually get close enough to get burned. But some parents will. Let's see what little squirt does, says the big sea turtle in uh, Finding Nemo. The kid will learn a lesson they will never forget. Fire should be treated with respect and you don't touch the fire. Just as there are two kinds of parents, there are two types of kids. One type of kid having mom told him, don't touch the fire, will never touch the fire, not until they become a teenager and rebellious, because uh, e -jar it, mom said it's dangerous and I trust mom. But there are some people who have to find out for themselves. So what they'll do is they'll wait until not, mom's not around and then they'll touch it on their own. And the second type of parenting then eventuates. They learn not to touch the fire. Anyway, because every creature on Earth has an instinctive fear of fire, now we're traveling as Homo erecti through new parts of the Earth. And these parts of the Earth have tigers, like saber-toothed tigers. They have lions. They've got dire bears. Oh, bleeping my! But we've got fire! And with fire and torches, we can hold off or even fight off the biggest land animals. But Homo erectus probably knows how to capture fire, as found in the wild, and how to use fire. He probably doesn't yet know how to make fire. That comes later. Still, Homo erectus, because he has fire, has the first human lifestyle. Light in the darkness, cooked food, warmth, community sharing around the fire. And fire is the world's first weapon of mass destruction. Imagine for a moment that this table has, uh, is, is a forest. And there's a cliff on these two sides. The forest goes up and then there's a cliff. Well, let's say the wind is blowing steadily from this direction. Throck, Grunk, and I will light fires here, here, and here. And if the wind keeps blowing in this direction, the fires will come together in an arc and will drive towards the cliffs until they go out. And in front of the fire, Every creature that can't fly away is going to run as fast as they can. And some of them will be able to clamber down the cliffs. And some of them won't. And they'll end up jumping off the cliffs. And then it's raining meat. Hallelujah. Raining meat from the sky. The rest of the tribe is down here gathering the falling meat rain. Fire can be used as a weapon of mass destruction to hunt. If we're hungry, it's not hunting, it's killing, if, you're, if there's no challenge. And that's killing with the fire. The problem is, though, that the wind is not always cooperative. And if Gronk, Thrunk, and I go out and start the fires there and the wind changes, we could ourselves become the crispy critters. Later on, as we wage war with one another, fire is also going to come in handy. We've used fire from savage days up through the atom bomb and the hydrogen bomb and napalm and flamethrowers. Fire is a weapon that is still horrifyingly terrible. And um, so when Homo erectus masters fire, he masters something quintessentially human, our first, our first real big technology and our first uh, weapon of mass destruction. Now we come to the first of the modern men. The first of the modern men, uh, modern people are called Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens means thinking man. And there are many varieties of Homo sapiens that appear from the last 
hundred thousand years or more. Homo sapiens. This is Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. Neanderthal man. The quintessential brutish looking caveman. He looks like an orc. He's got sort of coarse features. He's got a nose. He's got brow ridges just like the others to protect the head. He's got a big forehead, though, like we do, and he actually has a larger brain case than we do. Neanderthals have bigger brains than we do, but it's proportioned differently. They have more of a middle and back brain and less of a forebrain. Now, why does this matter? Because the brain above our eyes is where we keep all our stuff. It's where we keep our personality. It's where we keep the memory of our identity, of who we are, and of what makes us special and different as compared to other people in the world. This is where I live, in this forebrain area above the eyes. The Neanderthal has that enough to be an individual, the way we are. Homo erectus? Maybe, probably, but we're not sure. They would have something of a human mentality. Homo habilis, probably not. On the way to that, but not yet fully there because the brain, especially the forebrain, simply is not big enough. And forget Australopithecus, he doesn't have that part of the brain except in a vestigial or proto form. But Neanderthal man has it. Now, Homo sapiens Neanderthalensis is specialized to Ice Age Europe during the last Ice Age. During the last ice age, much of Europe was under glaciers, and those parts that weren't are like the Arctic Circle, like northern Siberia or northern Canada. Homo erecti tended to be shorter and squatter than we are, and they also tended to have thicker bones and thicker barrel chests. Why? Because all of that thick bones, thick muscle, and they had a lot of that, and the sort of squat barrel chested look, all of that is going to help the Neanderthal keep their vital organs from getting too close to the surface of their body and therefore from getting too cold. The Neanderthal is able to preserve body heat around their vital organs better than, than we willowy uh, later day Africans can. We also know that Neanderthal has a human personality because they do something that is the first proof of religion in natural history. The first proof. There are others that might be, but this is. When a Neanderthal dies, sometimes they're posed and they're placed in a burial hole. And they're placed in a burial hole with food, tools, and weapons. Now understand at this point in time, there was no food surplus. Every bit of food given to the dead was food that a living person really could have used. Tools took hours, days, weeks to make, and they wore out quickly. They'd have to be constantly maintained. This is the equivalent of the woman in the 1970s who, when she died without children and without any surviving relatives, chose to be buried in her brand new Cadillac. This was California, of course. So they took a steam shovel, opened up a big ramp-like hole, drove the Cadillac in, placed the woman there in her best dress with her jewelry like an Egyptian pharaoh, and then uh, rolled up the windows, closed the Cadillac off, and bulldozed it over and put a gravestone on top of it. This really happened. So this woman is buried with her Cadillac. Now, that is the equivalent today of being buried with a car that costs between fifty dollars and $100,000 towards the $100,000 mark, more likely. Nobody does that, except that woman and other people like them, because it is a profligate waste of things that the living might use in order to do what? Well, that's, that's the question. Why on earth would Neanderthals bury the dead with food that the living could eat with tools that the living could use, and with weapons that the living could fight with? And the answer is, there's no rational explanation except one. A religious belief in an afterlife. Some kind of happy hunting ground. 
The dead will pass on to another world like this, you see, but it's different. It's maybe more eternal. It's maybe more spiritual. A happy hunting ground is some of the Paleolithic cultures that we've come into contact with in recent times, they'd call it. And in the happy hunting grounds, the newly awakened, newly arrived deceased soul, the honored dead, won't be naked. They'll have clothes. They won't be hungry. They'll have initial food supplies. They won't be powerless. They'll have tools to use and weapons to hunt with. Those are all gifts of the living. What this means is that religious sensibilities about the afterlife are older than the modern human species. That's amazing. Religion is older than human beings in our modern sense. Neanderthal man survives unto the time when us, our latter-day African selves, come out of Africa. But before we go on, let's talk about the good and the bad of the growing brain, because Neanderthal man clearly has it. The good that comes out of the brain is that we are not creatures defined by our instinctive programmings. This is the flaw of all racism. Racism of black superiority, of white supremacy, of Korean or Japanese uh, chauvinism. All of that assumes that we're like livestock, like dogs, and that we are programmed through our genetic selves. That is not true. With our growing brains, with the forebrain, the brain above our eyes, we break our instinctive programming and we choose to be who we are. We make choices and decisions about what we are going to be. We don't have to be what our instincts tell us. In fact, the whole point of growing up is to learn how to discipline your instincts so that they will serve you and so that you won't be the slave of your own passions. From this ability to think and choose for ourselves and not simply be the arrow shot by our genetic heritage, we get all culture and civilization. We get every advance that we've had because we have the imagination to think of things that never were and make them happen. Farming, cities, and so forth. So what's the downside? The downside of having a growing brain. Hmm. Um, it's the same thing. The growing brain allows us to remember. So we draw our own conclusions about the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. It allows us to think, to imagine for ourselves. It allows us to make choices. These are all good things unless they lead to evil. The most dangerous thing on earth is a human being, a brilliant human being, who's a sociopath, who hates people. History is filled with people like that. People who, without any guilt, cause megadeath around them, because their will be done. The most dangerous thing on earth, and I can prove this disadvantage of the growing brain by looking at other big-brained creatures. Chimpanzees. Jane Goodall, the great researcher of chimpanzees, to her horror in the 1990s realized uh, tribes of chimpanzees go to war with one another. They kidnap and they rape one another. They will fight and kill one another. To her horror, because she had spent decades with these groups of chimps, and now they're fighting one another, they're fighting other chimps. They're engaged in the same kind of evil that we used to assume human beings were unique at. Well, there are now... Three or four species on the earth that we know wage war. Ants, maybe bees, chimpanzees, and human beings. Four creatures that engage in this special weird thing known as warfare. Another example. There is a... Um, a documentary series on ocean life that was made 15 or 20 years ago called Blue Planet. 
beautiful, absolutely wonderful photography, incredible, uh, thoughtful storytelling about life in the seas and oceans of the world, the coastal, the deep, and so forth. And on two occasions, I saw things that haunt me to this day. On one occasion, there is a gray whale and her pup swimming as fast as they can through the open ocean, being chased by a pod of rogue killer whales. Now, killer whales normally live the way early humans did, as nomadic hunter-gatherers in groups. But the males, like uh, in some human groups, leave when they become adults and they find their own pod. But some males never do. They become like street gangs. They team up with other males. And from that point, their whale song diverges. It's like a different language. And they begin going rogue. They'll hunt their own kind. They'll hunt killer whales and other whales. And they'll eat them by preference. Whereas normal whales, normal killer whales, will eat seals and things like that. Maybe other species of whales. But rogue killer whales go cannibal. And they, well, they also do things like this. So one of the two killer whales gets a hold of the pup. And instead of just eating him or crippling him or bringing him to a point where the other whales can take the pup away from its mom, the killer whale goes, whee, 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 and the little baby uh, gray whale flies end over end across the sea to another to where other killer whales are. And then it gets tossed back and they play a little game while the mother dies of her wounds or is so exhausted that she can't at least fight for her child. So there's that. There's another scene in another episode where the seals are breeding on the shore and the little baby seals are getting ready to go back into the water for the first time to, to explore the great oceans. But the killer whales know the pattern. And so they're there when the seal babies are going back into the water. Hmm. They're waiting because it's lunchtime. The little baby seals are prey. The ones that get past the killer whales get to live. The ones that don't, don't. But again, among these big-brained creatures, the, the killer whale, the orca, they'll, there, there's the scene of one of the baby seals being captured, and again, whee, being tossed end over end, and another killer whale comes up and, like a soccer player, headbutts it with its nose. Whoop! and then gets it and tosses it back, and they're playing a game of catch or volleyball or something. Now, in both those cases, that's not survival te techniques. That's not natural instincts. That's not like a cat playing with its food, because a cat is programmed to play with its food so that it can boost its hunting skills. No, what's happening here is evil. Evil. The cruel, malicious choice to cause harm because it's fun. That is sadism, which is evil. And killer whales are quite capable of it. Dolphins, which are much nicer and much more nice to human beings, have been known to take female oceanographers and rub up against them in what seems to be a form of sexual assault. Why would they do that? They're different species. In all cases, dolphins, killer whales, chimpanzees, you're dealing with big-brained creatures who have the capacity to overcome their instinctive programming. Instincts don't make people evil. They make them brutal. Instincts don't make creatures, should I say, evil. But our big brains, the things that gave us civilization, also give us evil. When we leave the Garden of Eden, we are no longer protected by the instincts that tell us right from wrong. We have to work those things out for ourselves. And in doing so, we grow brains capable of great good and diabolical evil. Now we come to the last group. Homo sapiens sapiens. Modern human beings. No real brow ridges. A little slight bump in the skull, but for the most part, no real brow ridges. A distinct mouth, chin, and nose, all separated out. 
The Neanderthals have this too, but it's a little coarser. Big, giant cranium. Yeah, a brain that's smaller by cubic centimeters than the Neanderthal, but a brain that emphasizes the forebrain, the frontal lobes, the part of the brain where we keep ourselves, our personality, and our identity. We are frailer than the Neanderthals. Without the brow ridges, it's much easier to kill a human being by traumatic head trauma. Our bones are lighter. Our musculature is less strong than a Neanderthals. However, modern Homo sapiens about 40,000 years ago developed something. And all Homo sapiens, all modern humans come from a source as recent as I think less than, certainly less than 40,000 years ago. I think it's actually closer to 20. 20,000 years ago, our species, our subspecies comes out of Africa. And we are tall and willowy compared to the Neanderthals and to the other Homo erecti and other things that we're encountering. Well, not Homo erecti, they're gone. Now, what advantage could we possibly have? We got the voice box. And the voice box allows us to sculpt sound like Michelangelo. Before the voice box, we have the ability to maybe communicate with our hands. Maybe Neanderthals did that. And we have the ability to convey basic things. Ah! Ah! Hmm. We've got basic things. Most animals have their mouth area, and they've got two separate tubes, one leading to their stomach, one leading to their lungs. Human beings, especially modern humans, join up the two. So you've got the mouth area, and then they separate, and then they join up, and then they separate again. And that junction box where they join up again before separating is called the voice box. And in the voice box are a series of vocal cords. We can sculpt sound, again, like a master sculptor. Human beings uh, can produce naturally, I think, about 50 phonemes. A phoneme is a distinct sound, like ah, or t, or s, or r, or r, or Now, we don't use all of them in English. This sound is used in the Bushman language of the Kalahari. Uh, so if you hear Bushman talking, it's... I, I can't do it, but they, they, they're, they click a lot. The Japanese don't have an L sound in their language naturally. So if you're saying something like uh, television, it would be teravis, teravis. They substitute an R. If you're saying something black, it would be barak, barak, not black because they don't have an L sound. It would take a very good English speaker to develop the ability to say an L sound. Uh, in Spanish, there is the R con R, you know, the, the rolled R. We don't use that in English, so it's difficult for an English speaker. And German, forget about it. All sorts of sounds we don't use. So phonemes allow human beings to craft languages. And with modern language, this is the last thing we're going to do today, with modern language, we are no longer isolated prisoners in our prison of meat and bone that is the skull. No, no, we're not. What we are is able to communicate with precision because we teach each other this con game of language where pen means this thing and glasses means this thing and beard means this thing, ID means this thing and bald means that thing. If we all agree on those things meaning that, then we can, through symbolic logic, have language. Now, here's the key. Before we have language, evolution is the story of changes in our bodies that happen over hundreds of thousands, millions, or even billions of years. But the world has changed more in the last 20,000 years, especially the last 10 or 12,000 years, than it ever had before quickly. And the reason is we can talk to one another. 
and in talking to one another, we become more than the sum of our parts. Our communities become more than the sum of our parts. We are able to organize. We are able to do things with one another that we could not do simply saying, fear, anger, interest. No, we can communicate precisely. And that precision is going to lead to the, the, the apex of our time as hunter-gatherers, and ultimately it's going to lead to us becoming farmers and city dwellers and civilized. Human history is a result of language, which is a product of the voice box, which is the last evolutionary development that we have as human beings. By the way, the disadvantage of the voice box should be obvious. We have a much higher choking risk than most creatures. And I know this because I've almost choked to death on two or three occasions, and it's scary as hell. But uh, that is because things can get lodged in our throat or maybe even stuck. And if you can't get them out, you could be dead. That voice box just gives another area where the tubes come together that should be separate for the stomach and the, uh, and the lungs. So the downside is, you know, we might choke more. So where we'll pick things up on Monday is as we develop language and art, what sorts of things do we produce? I thank you for your time. Remember that there's a unit survey. I think there's a unit survey due Monday. Let me see. Uh, Monday, October 19th, chapter survey three. Uh, yep, that's due. And then you've got a week off. So uh, get the unit survey, chapter survey three done. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. <laughs>